speak a little faster than I normally would, but I will try to speak clearly. Okay? The uh, leading science plays a leading role in our lives today. Nobody will deny that. Uh, the material benefits of science have been science? enormous. Uh, but this comes at a cost uh, at the psychological level because many things that, that humanity once believed, science has overturned. We know that the Earth no longer is the center of the universe. We know that humanity is no longer exceptional. We come from other, uh, other organisms. No. Um, the uh, science has demythologized a lot of our religious beliefs, not all of them, but many of them. Uh, free will seems to be nonsense in, this, in, the, in, in the context of, 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 of inviolate physical laws. Uh, even the individual sometimes is seen as an illusion, like an onion, where you peel back the layers trying to get to the core, but there's no core there. And in the context of universal laws of physics, Virtually everything else besides material is considered to be epiphenomenal. My, uh, my example of this, my favorite example, comes from my youth when Carl Sagan, a noted uh, American physicist who, who would interpret science for television audiences, had this long uh, uh, episode of uh, programs called Cosmos. And in one of them was devoted to evolution. Now, Carl Sagan loved dinosaurs as a child so that he had these beautiful graphics, computer graphics, much, you know, much earlier than now, uh, of these big dinosaurs fighting with one another, copulating, eating, doing all sorts of things. And his very last sentence in this thing is, are, these are some of the things that molecules do. Okay? The idea is that you have the molecules, you have the laws, everything else is epiphenomenal. Epiphenomenal means there's, it has no causal reality. It's like the image on a, on a motion picture. Uh, it seems to be there, but it, it has, has no causality. So that, as a consequence, uh, physics has assumed a position in our society uh, very much like, uh, well, let's go back to the Renaissance. If you remember the great chain of being, uh, uh, like a pyramid that had God at the top, and the Pope, and the bishops, and the priests, and the laity, and the, the animals, and the minerals, and so forth. Well, today we have this, this physics is at the top, and then we have uh, 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 chemistry, and, and thermodynamics, and molecular biology, we have the other sciences, and then at the bottom we have the humanities. And that's sort of the four of, uh, uh, of, of our, our state of knowledge to these days. Kaufman has called this the era of physics, the domination of all of science by physics. Now, there are four physical laws. Uh, they are inviolate, they are never violated, they are ubiquitous, they are everywhere, and they are unseasoned. So that many have come to say, well, physical law determines everything. Law determines all. Okay? Now, this isn't just a popular opinion. Some of the best minds of science have advocated this. Nobel laureates, such as Murray Gell-Mann, Steven Weinberg, and David Gross, have said that all causality of origins points downwards. And there is nothing down there but the laws of physics. So here we have a consensus of some of the best minds in all of science. That leads us to ask, is there any alternative to this totalism of physics? Well, I would call upon uh, uh, a, little, uh, a little saying by a Polish phenomenologist by the name of Karol Wojtyla, who was talking about the relationship between science and belief. And he said that science should prune belief of superstition. Science should take superstition out of belief. He also said belief should warn science against false absolutes. False absolutes. Well, what does a, an absolute mean in science, a discipline that, that professes no absolutes? The rest of my talk, I'm going to, to try to, to argue against the totality, the totalism of physics uh, by showing that it rests on some false absolutes. And I begin with the four major laws of physics. They are strong and weak nuclear forces. Who 
Coulombic electrical forces and gravitation. We also have the thermodynamic laws of conservation of energy and uh, dissipation of energy, but I'm going to put them on the side for the while. Concentrating on the four force laws. Okay? Notice that all four of these laws are predicated upon material, as if the cause itself emanates from the material. Okay? Gravitation emanates from mass. Coulombic attraction comes from the electrons and the protons, um, and, and so forth. Okay. Uh, these laws are, are uh, inviolate. They're everywhere all the time. Now, notice that they are universal and can be stated only in terms of universal variables, okay? Such as mass or charge. Very generic universal variables. Anything else that, per that pertains to a particular situation becomes part of what is called the boundary statement, uh, or the boundary specifications, or the boundary conditions. Um, to give you an example, if I want to, to calculate the, the pathway of a, of a cannonball, uh, I need to, to invoke Newton's second law in gravitation, those are the laws. And that's what we focus on. But I also have to know the muzzle velocity cannonball comes out of the I have to know the orientation of the cannon, and I have to know the mass of the cannonball. Those are the boundary conditions, boundary specifications. Now, any real problem requires two elements. One element is the law, and we always focus on the laws. They are inviolable. The other element that's necessary are the boundary conditions, and we hardly ever talk about them. I'm saying that the boundary conditions must be purely arbitrary, okay? We have to allow for purely arbitrary boundary conditions. Why? Because if we could find boundary conditions for which the laws were violated, then they would not be universal. So it's true by definition, okay? Uh, the thing is that uh, we normally choose very simple boundary conditions. We, we, we take the low-hanging fruit, if you will. Uh, so that the boundary conditions become anything that the investigator chooses them to be. Chooses this volition uh, means that intentionality is, 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 is wrapped up with the boundary value problem and with arbitrariness, uh, contingency, if you will. So the boundary conditions must be contingent. Contingency is a legitimate element of any problem statement. Now notice I use the word contingency and not chance. There's a reason for that. Because when I say the word chance, most people think of blind chance. Chance that is directionless, uh, that is simple, uh, repeatable, and uh, may concern events or objects that are totally indistinguishable. Those are four conditions for blind chance. Uh, but chance, arbitrary contingency, is not always blind. Uh, consider, for example, uh, the probability of loaded, rolling loaded dice, dice that have a bias to them. Uh, uh, the idea is that um, they, the, the outcome is arbitrary, but connected with the material configuration, you know, the biased dice, the, uh, uh, you know, chance is no longer blind. There is a preferential direction towards certain numbers and away from certain other numbers. Um, repeatable. Okay. Um, there are there are physicists. There is one physicist in particular, Walter Elsasser, who says that in the biological world we need to be cognizant of unique events totally unique events that happen once and ne never more, possibly never more. Uh, and you say, how is that possible in a world that's 13 and a half billion years old? Well, uh, uh, it just so happens that, that once you look at the probabilities, when you have more than about 75 distinguishable elements, uh, the combinations among them are greater than the simple events that have ever occurred in the entire history 
of the universe, okay? So that if, if they come together by random, chances are in another lifetime or another 20 lifetimes in the universe, they will not occur again. I call such things radical chance. And radical chance happens all the time in ecology because we always have hundreds of organisms or thousands of organisms. And the combinations between these distinguishable organisms is legion. So radical chance has to be added. Uh, it's actually more radical than blind chance. Then you have conditional probabilities like loaded dice. And you also have things which uh, Karl Popper calls propensity. Uh, after a while, certain results become uh, very regular. They occur most of the time, 90, 95% of the time. And, uh, and, and, and other things can occur, but only rarely. And then, of course, at the very end, you have determinism. So the idea is that we have this entire spectrum of contingency, uh, not just blind chance. And we have to deal with the entire spectrum. Okay. Uh, it's erroneous. It's erroneous, I would say, to, to assume that chance and, all, and, and law act dichotomously. In other words, it's either chance or necessity, as Monod used to put it. Uh, that's, a, that's an important dichotomy that's made that, that uh, uh, a lot of science rests upon. Okay, I've talked about chance and contingency, and you asked me, well, what about order? There is order in the world after all. Where does it come from? Slide one, please. Well, okay. Order can come from law. Law plays a part in order, obviously. But uh, I, would, I, would, I would suggest to you that law probably plays less of a part in most explanations than do mutualisms within the living community. And I would like to, uh, uh, to bring to your attention a dynamic called autocatalysis. And the idea here is we have a process A. It may be contingent, it may be deterministic, it doesn't matter. Uh, which, when it occurs, it, it, it speeds up, it facilitates a process B, which facilitates process C, which in turn facilitates process A, so that the action of A actually rewards itself, if you will. Uh, an example, slide two, uh, would be, well, no, okay, excellent. Yeah, would be uh, utricularia. This is a, an aquatic weed that is carnivorous, okay? Uh, it, it, it grows like a, like a feather in the water, and it has these little utricles on it, which if you look under a microscope, uh, have hairs on one end, and there's an opening. And if anything, any organism like this comes along and touches the hairs, it opens it up, and the, the, the organism is sucked in, and it closes, and the, the uh, uh, the utricularia consumes the organism. Next slide. Uh, and this utricularia, uh, the surface of it is the host to, uh, to paraphyte, to algae, small animal cells that attach to the surface uh, and take, take advantage of the currents by doing that. It grows faster. The organisms come down to eat the paraphyte and they are eaten by utricularia. So you establish a uh, uh, a, a, a cycle. Uh, now, I maintain that autocatalysis plus contingency results in non-mechanical behavior. Uh, in particular, one thing is selection. Okay. Now, suppose something happens in B, any sort of arbitrary contingency happens in B, and suppose that that event either makes it more sensitive to catalysis by A or makes it a better catalyst of C. If either of those happens, then it will receive more from A. It will be rewarded. Okay? Conversely, suppose there is a, uh, uh, an event at B that makes it less sensitive to A or a poor catalyst of B, then it will receive less from A. It will be uh, it will be punished, okay? It will uh, have a negative reinforcement. The idea here is that in autocatalysis, there is a preferred direction. That preferred direction is greater autocatalysis. This is an asymmetric situation, okay? 
Um, okay. Uh, next slide, please. Now, processes A, B, and C do not occur without resources. They need uh, they need resources, you know, food, energy, and so forth from their environment. Uh, suppose the change in B causes more, allows it to get more of its resources and to speed up. Well, that will be rewarded. And conversely, if something happens that makes makes it can't pull more in, it will be it will be uh, uh, not rewarded. It will be again. So that there is a reward for bringing in more into B. But that applies to C and to A as well. So that we have what, what Isaac Newton calls centripetality. When you have an autocatalytic configuration, there is a tendency over time, as it interacts with uh, contingency, to, to bring more and more into the autocatalytic group. Usually, at the expense of non-participants. Now, uh, an example, an example of such this in ecology would be coral reefs. Coral reefs generally exist in an ocean that is a biological desert. There's very little nutrients uh, uh, and so forth uh, that, it, that, 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 that inhabit the ocean. But, but the coral reefs tend to sequester, tend to pull in those nutrients and keep it in circulation within the coral reef. This is the growth side of the Darwinian narrative. Because when Darwin first described evolution, he talked about sort of two sides. He says you have this Malthusian growth, okay, and you have natural selection. Growth supplies and Malthusian selection decreases. Um, what has happened over time is that we've forgotten about the growth. We kind of, it's hard to explain growth, so we put it into the background and we consider it given. And we concentrate everything on natural selection. Uh, I think we need to start to rehabilitate the positive side of the Darwinian narrative. Um, the Darwinian narrative, as it now stands, the major, the major attribute, the major event is competition. Okay. Uh, but centripetality induces competition. Suppose, for example, uh, we have B, and something like D appears, and it is either a uh, more sensitive to A or a better catalyst of C. Then the ensuing dynamics will be such that D will dominate, and B will either disappear or fall into the background, so that D re uh, replaces replaces B. Um, notice also that this, this configuration may be among other configurations, and they are all pulling into themselves, so there's a, there's a competition that's induced between them. So what I'm going to say is that centripetality induces competition. Centripetality is prior to competition, is more primitive and more necessary. You cannot have competition anywhere without mutualism at the next level down. Okay? The fact that uh, uh, foxes and coyotes may be competing uh, has to do with this enormous mutualism within the bodies of the, of, of the competing organisms. Okay? Competition is impossible. This has, this has certain ethical consequences, I might say, because you've probably heard of, of uh, Darwinian uh, uh, Moral, uh, the Huxley's uh, term. Anyway, uh, it, uh, uh, it it's an inversion of priorities. We have we have conferences that people go to to talk about how cooperation can be possible in a world of competition, but that's inverted because because cooperation is more fundamental than competition. Okay. Okay. So let's take a step back and take a look at the larger picture. Uh, the laws are inviolate. Are inviolate. Okay, I'm not saying that laws are 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 are, are violated. They are constraining, but they are not determining. Why not? Well, because of the boundary conditions. We always assume that we can state the boundary conditions, and whenever we state the boundary conditions, we can predict. But Nature doesn't realize that, that we have to state the boundary conditions. 
Um, they can be contingent. They can be intractable. And as a matter of fact, in ecology, with radical chance, uh, they are intractable. It is impossible to, 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 stick, to enumerate all of, the, uh, all of the boundary conditions. Well, that's sort of epistemological, but, but, but there's also another problem that Stuart Kaufman has brought up, and that is that uh, we, can never, we can never state the boundary conditions uh, beforehand because the categories we need to state them still don't exist. Uh, and we see that most uh, often in, in, in situations called acceptations, which I, 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 uh, uh, I thank Professor Hilton for. Uh, for example, you have something like uh, a cavity within an aquatic organism that was uh, started to develop uh, as a lung to, to transport gases into the body tissue. But, but after a while, uh, conditions change, and the organism used that cavity, expanding and, and, and contracting it, to regulate its position in the water column. So that uh, a, a, an organ for, that developed for one purpose, suddenly, uh, for reasons that we cannot fully state because they're intractable, is now uh, being used in another direction for another function. Now, notice that, uh, yeah, that autocatalysis uh, is selecting amongst these compositions. Uh, but you know, Matsuno, I think, called them frozen axes. I don't know if that was Kachiro's uh, word or not. But uh, uh, the idea is that autocatalysis uh, selects among uh, the many, many contingencies and rejects most of them because it's a stable configuration and can even reproduce itself without DNA. But, uh, uh, but uh, certain, certain contingencies that, that help the autocatalysis are incorporated into the dynamic and become part of the internal dynamic. They become a frozen accident, if you will. Now, if this is not particularly clear, I would like to, to bring in a metaphor for what is going on, a metaphor that was brought about by, by John Wheeler, John A. Wheeler, a very eminent physicist who thought about these philosophical questions in, in physics. He was one of the few physicists that really thought bigger outside the box. Wheeler was worried about constructivism in physics, and Professor Collier was, has written a paper on this and talked about it to me about it this morning. The idea that physicists were looking for these new particles, this was back in the 20th, middle of the 20th century, and they had this theory that predicted certain particles with spin and flavor and various characteristics. They hadn't seen them yet. So what they did is they went them to their uh, cyclotrons and, and their laboratories, and they created the conditions most likely to see that particle. And they would see the particle, they would discover it, they would write the paper and get the Nobel Prize and whatnot. Uh, but the question remains, in Wheeler's mind, did they discover the particle or did they create the part? <laughs> okay, I'd like to perform an acceptation of that. I would like to use Wheeler's, uh, uh, Wheeler's ideas as a metaphor for, for evolution. And the, the metaphor that Wheeler uses is a parlor game. Okay, the idea is that we've been invited to a dinner, but the dinner is late. And the host or hostess says, please amuse yourself with a game. So we decide we are going to play 20 questions. Uh, the idea is we will take someone, uh, Professor L9, and send them out of the room, and then we will decide on a word. He will come back. He will ask us questions that we can answer only with yes or no, nothing else. Okay. Uh, so he goes out of the room, and we close the door. And I say, now, I'm, I'm a mean guy. I say, there is no word, okay? Uh, there is no word, okay? He's going to come in, and he'll ask the first questions. Maybe he'll ask you know, Professor Hilton uh, uh, a question. And he can say yes or no. Absolutely, however he feels. Yes or no. 
<laughs> the second question he asks of, of Professor Collier, and he, said, he can say yes or no however he wants to. The only condition on his answer is it cannot contradict his answer. And then he goes around, uh, you know, Professor Ney and uh, everybody else, and this continues until, uh, until finally he says, uh, uh, a palavra e ecologia, and the only answer is sim. Okay? <laughs> now imagine how this looks to him. I mean, we, we, we said ecology at the first, and, and yet, uh, uh, you know, this was self constructed. Now, why I like this for evolution? Because the laws of physics, I think, correspond to the rules of this game. Okay? There are certain, you know, we, we cannot violate, we should not violate them, we can, but we should not violate them. And they, they help the, the, the game go orderly. But they do not determine the endpoint. They constrain, but do not determine. What determines the end point? It's a dialogue between, between uh, contingencies, okay? The, uh, the questioner, uh, whoever's being asked the question, uh, who's ever answering the question, is trying to narrow down the possibilities as much as possible. Uh, the respondents, everybody else, is trying to broaden it and keep the game going, okay? Because we have an analogy here with autocatalytic dynamics, which is selective, okay? So all of these contingencies are coming out and it selects and narrows down the possibilities. On the other hand, we have entropy, the, thermo, the second law of thermodynamics that says that things just tend to fall apart and become incoherent and whatnot. Uh, this entropy decays the existing configurations, one, number one, and it, it, but it also creates new possibilities. So that there is a Hegelian element to this dialectic in the sense that in order to keep one progressing, autocatalysis needs, at, a, at the next level up, needs the contingency. Uh, and then vice versa, as things become more complicated, things dissipate more. So that at the next level up, there's mutual necessity. You have, uh, uh, what do you say, um, uh, conflict at one level and mutual necessity at the, at the longer, in the longer term. Um, but uh, uh, I like the, I like the, the, the metaphor because, because what we take home from this is that laws do not determine the path of evolution. They are instrumental, they are constraining, but they do not determine. Every form, every form that we see, every form that we encounter, somewhere is the result of a contingency. Okay? Everything. And that includes physical phenomena as well. Okay? To paraphrase Bertrand Russell, evolution is driven by configurations of contingency. Uh, uh, Bertrand Russell knew about Centripetality. He didn't call it centripetality. He gave it a terrible name. He called it chemical imperialism. You know, about organisms bringing uh, resources, chemical resources, into themselves. But it was the same concept. And he said, "This is the drive behind all of evolution." It's a very heterodox, heretical statement because you know everybody knows that competition is the drive behind all of evolution. Also, I will say that it's not new. Those of you familiar with evolutionary theory know that Stephen Jay Gould, uh, about 15 or 20 years ago while he was still alive, talked about evolution being driven by blind directionless chance. Okay? Uh, and, and he was referring to a very similar dynamic. But he and I would differ in the sense that he narrows in on blind chance, and I say, no, that's, that's a false dichotomy. You know, you have the spectrum of contingency, much of which is, di is, is directional, and can even include intentionalities. So, Kaufman says, this is the end of the era of physics. The idea that physics is no longer at the top of the apex, that the other sciences, like ecology, like sociology, and so forth, now have a chance to come forth and elucidate a new dynamics. 
which you know does not violate physics, but is very different and and uh, and explains matters better than uh, more directly than, than the laws of, of physics. We inhabit, I say, a world of contingencies. That disturbs a lot of people because many people want to think that we inhabit a world of laws and laws determine everything. But I would say we are not left orphans. There are uh, uh, there are tools that we can use to not be not determine the future and predict the future exactly, but to tell us more or less which directions systems are going in. And those have to do with, uh, 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 with networks, for example. Uh, where is it? Uh, uh, there it is. Uh, the idea that a network, most you know, networks have been very popular lately, but they're always looked at in a mechanical way. This is a mechanical configuration. But that's not the whole story. Okay? Any network represents uh, an amalgamation, a fusion of, of, uh, me of mechanical constraint and indeterminacy. Think of it. If you're at any one point in the network, you can't, you normally, usually cannot go to all the other points directly. Maybe indirectly, but not directly. You are constrained only to go into two or three others. Okay? However, among those two or three others, it's inter indeterminate where the next transfer will, will appear. And people tend to forget about that indeterminacy. But there are, there are mathematics that you can invoke on ecosystems to tell you, you give me a network, I'll give you back two numbers. One number tells me how constrained it is. The other number tells me how flexible and incoherent it is. And, and living systems require some of both. They require some of both. We tend to think of them as only in terms of the constraints. But things can be some co so constrained that they become brittle, they become hard, and, and you know, a perturbation comes and they just fall apart without requisite flexibility. And our data tell us that, that real ecosystems uh, do approach a boundary between rigid constraint and flexibility. As a matter of fact, the constraint is about 40% and the flexibility is about 60%. Anyway. So, the worldview has been reordered. Organisms are not epiphenomena. They're real causal agents. Each is unique, even, even microbiota. You can, you can, each is unique, and each can act as a causal agent. Human free will is totally possible. You have about four or five levels between synaptic uh, uh, firings and higher level thought. And each of those levels involves material and dynamical autocatalytic configurations. Each level involves contingencies. Um, and each of the contingencies have their particular directions and so forth. Therefore, intentionalities also have a place in the spectrum of contingency. That's good for you psychologists and sociologists. Okay? Um, also, it tells us that physical dynamical theory is sometimes a poor model for economic, social, and political phenomena. Okay, we tend to think, try to put everything into this box of physics, but, but the actual dynamics of physics are usually a poor metaphor. Um, it also says, and this is something people don't like, that, that there are individual and social responsibilities because there are now directions uh, to, these, to these configurations of processes, and each part has a, a, a role to play within it, uh, its responsibility, if you will, uh, so that it, it, it reinvigorates the, 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 the idea of, uh, of responsibility. Um, I won't go into science and belief. I think we're, we're running out of time. Uh, I'll just say that the world of contingencies is a brave new world. Uh, the laws of physics have not been overturned. They're still there. They're still operating. But a new window has opened. Uh, it's a world of enormous possibilities. It's a world of radical uncertainties. But it is not a world without order. It is a world 
That does allow some room for hope, however. That's it. Oh, I thought, I thought it was going to get away. <laughs> I have a question. I was thinking about uh, where is the ecology in your talk? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, okay. I, I see biology. Yeah, see, yeah. You, you discuss many levels, and uh, we're not talking particularly about ecology. You're we're absolutely right. About, uh, System perspective on biology. Yes, um, you know I, I, I hinted at it with the utricularia example and so forth. But where this really comes from, um, and I don't have the slide here, but I do have it. I will have it in the in the lectures uh, tomorrow and, and the next two days. Um, uh, where it comes from is is working with with networks of who eats who and by how much. And uh, uh, what we what I what I discovered uh, was that there is a particular formula for capturing how well organized the network is. So that, so that we can say if there is some pollution that comes um, and the disorganization decays somewhat, we can quantify that. that. This is very important if you want to, 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 scientifically, to me, scientifically demonstrate um, uh, uh, damage to, to, to the environment. Well, um, you could also apply this measure to the development of an organism. Absolutely. Yes, you could. So, now, the, the difference. Okay. The difference being, the difference being that organisms are almost machines. That's the problem. Okay. See, we we can't help it. We're narcissistic. Okay. We tend to think of biology in terms of the organisms. We tend to think of ourselves, etc. Um, and that's why I say that ecology is a propitious uh, theater to look at organization because it's it's not as mechanical as the organism. Uh, the organism is very fine-tuned, and uh, we do need flexibility, obviously, or I'll, you know, we'll die, but, but the ratio is very different from, from that in ecology. As I said, in ecology, it's 60% flexibility and 40% constraint. Um, so, that, so that ecology allows us to study the dynamics of life uh, without, uh, without interference from, from you know, genetics and... Uh, uh, and, and, and a lot of the almost mechanical phenomena that, that, we, that we talk about when we speak about bio, the biology of the organism. Now, when you go away into uh, economics or social systems, you, you, you get another problem, and that problem is intentionality, okay? And uh, most scientists don't want to allow intentionality as part of the discussion. Uh, uh, so consciousness and intentionality, you don't have to worry about them in ecology. You can just look at organization um, free from either you know, uh, genetics and, and strong mechanical behavior uh, or free from, from intentionality. Uh, uh, that's, how, that's the pathway that I took. But I, I don't have many ecological examples. You're absolutely right. When I, when I talked about centripetality, uh, I talked about uh, uh, the... the, the the, the coral reef, how the coral reef sequesters nutrients within itself. Um, you can look at it negatively. Uh, I like to talk about the soil on the, the island of Iceland. Uh, I don't know, Island, Iceland? Uh, Iceland. Uh, when Europeans first came to Iceland, there were very thick soils. Okay? But the Europeans cut down the wood for, for sailing mass and they let their goats and sheep go out on the, uh, on the island, and pretty soon the soil washed away, so that when the United States was practicing for the moon landing, they went to Iceland and they practiced in Iceland, okay? Because the, the soil is sort of evidence of the sequestering of nutrients by the entire ecosystem, and if you radically disturb the ecosystem, it bleeds away. Um, it's true. Uh, I, I confess I'm an engineer, and I tend to think in engineering terms, so I'm trying to, to generalize from the ecosystem to the organism, to the social system, to the economic system. So that when I give you this distilled form, there's hardly any ecology there. I agree. <laughs> What kind of role do you, you think that the, the constraints play in the big transitions in biology, like the 
unicellular uh, to unicellularity, uh, or I don't know, societies to superorganisms. What kind of role? Do you think? What kind of role does what play? The constraints. The constraints. The constraints, the constraints play. Well, the constraints. The constraints member are bound up in growth. Okay. Um, we don't. Ex we don't explicitly talk about them. I can measure constraint without knowing what's causing it. This is something that, that is foreign to a biologist, but to engineers do this all the time. The thermodynamics is an example. We don't know what the individual molecules are doing, but we can measure the very large uh, effects. In biology, we can measure the amount of constraint in a network without knowing exactly why things are flowing in this particular area. Uh, we might know a little bit more about social systems as to why they are flowing uh, there. But, uh, uh, but in any event, the idea is that the constraints are, uh, are part, part of this autocatalytic dynamic okay, that, that uh, actually channels resources in certain specific ways to facilitate growth. So that's the, the major role that constraint plays is to cause growth. Um, now, oftentimes, the constraints are, uh, are, are, are damaged by contingencies and you go somewhere else. But, but the major role of constraints in, in, eco in, in, in ecosystems and social systems and so forth uh, is, to, uh, is to, channel, uh, to channel resources along autocatalytic pathways. Do you feel that there's maybe, you know, another, another aspect to, to, to constraint that I haven't covered? I, I was thinking about uh, closed and open systems. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that the, 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 the constraints play a, a role in the, the way that they, they change the behavior of the system. And the system becomes more, more closed. Yes, 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 you're right, you're right. It tends to become more internalized. Um, uh, I put up uh, I put up this this cycle uh, with inputs. You're absolutely right. What happens is that uh, the amount that's circulated within grows with respect to how much you have to put in, uh, so that it becomes dominantly internalized. You're absolutely right. Um, and uh, sometimes the ex the external inputs can can even decrease, and 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 still the. Uh, the internal cycling will, but but there's a limit to that. There's a limit to that because the system uh, is is taking all of this in from other systems. It's becoming very brittle. Everything is is now being connected in lockstep, obligate fashion. The constraint grows so heavy that it is vulnerable to 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 to, to, to collapse. Okay, um, we see this in economic systems. Um, well, I won't go into that, but uh, uh, economic systems tend to overshoot the proper balance between, uh, uh, between, between the financial market and the physical economy, and, and what we get is this boom and bust cycle. They, they, they overdevelop and then crash. Um, but uh, no, you're right. You're right that uh, 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 systems do tend to become more and more internalized and inter internally endogenously dependent and constrained, yes. Thanks. Up to a limit. Also, you, you talk about centric vitality as the way of growing, uh, yeah. growing better through cooperation. But your examples, uh, I don't see very much difference between the example uh, when you change one of components, the B, enter the system because it is more efficient mm -hmm. to, the, to the performance of the yeah. Whole, yeah. Uh, process. Well, uh, and it changes from B to D mm -hmm. because D is more efficient. But it could change from B to B1, which mm -hmm. is a little bit more. Yes. So yes. Uh, what's the difference between competition and cooperation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as I said, competition is derivative of cooperation. Cooperation is primary, competition is secondary. No, uh, you're absolutely right that that uh, uh, it doesn't have to be exchanged. It can be it can be guided. You have the entire system essentially guiding changes within one of the components, so that it's it's guiding the improvement of, of the component. That's that's a 
very legitimate scenario. Um, I would say that uh, the, the difference between, between cooperation and competition mostly has to, is hierarchical, mostly, uh, in that uh, your, your mutualism at one level induces competition at the next level. So I would say that's probably the demarcation between the two. But in, either, in any scenario, mutualism is always primary. That's, that's according to me. Otherwise, the system wouldn't exist. It wouldn't, it wouldn't compete. It can't compete. Yeah. It, unless it's drawn. You know, I see centripetality as a basic, fundamental attribute of life. It, it, you, you see these lists of, you know, what does it mean for a system to be alive? You never see centripetality on there. Yeah, you Google centripetality, you get a few hits from me, and that's all. Uh, but I, I really feel that, that, that autocatalytic centripetality is a major, major factor in, the, in, in, in the, the, the dynamics of life. I have a few economists who agree with me because you know, they see these, these autocatalytic hookups in economic systems very often. And boom, they, they make the system But run. the evolution of centripetality, which means uh, a system that is becoming each more time uh, centripetal, uh, how do I say? Each time more centripetal. Uh -huh. are growing. Yeah. Uh, the evolution of this is through competition between different forms of centripet systems. Uh, okay, I, I see where you I see where you go. <laughs> you give a talk to philosophers, they always catch you. <laughs> no, I, I would I would say I would say I would rephrase it. Maybe it's a matter of, of Perspective. I would rephrase it to say that each time you have an increment, it's due to a, uh, a contingency. Okay, uh, so that uh, uh, if you want to say the contingencies are competing against one another, okay, but I don't see it very meaningful. Uh, uh, if you want to say that there is a com competition between one form and a virtual form, you can say that too, but I'm not sure how. How, how meaningful that statement is either. In other words, I, I have trouble in my own mind framing competition on, a, on the same level as, 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 as mutualism. Well, I was just wondering if uh, the evolution of mutualism toward even more uh, connected system mm -hmm. is through, through the, competition. the selection between systems, which yeah, are yeah. variants. Yes. Yeah. Of this. Yes. So well, that, that, that happens at the next level. Yes. That's yes, that's true. absolutely that's true. Like and it happens at the next level. And as, as I say, I think the distinction is hierarchical. That, that uh, the, the, origin, the origin of competition lies at a lower level of mutuality. And it, and it becomes competition at the next level up. Well, I don't know, you know, without putting formula up here that, that you know, that, that may, you know, bore everybody to death. Anyway, um, okay, the idea is that, that um, uh, if we have a network where everything is connected with everything else, um, I would say that this, this has zero assignments to it, okay? There's zero constraint. If I'm editing one point, there's no constraints on where, where the flow will go to next, okay? At the other extreme, the other extreme is if there's an obligate transfer. If I'm at any one point, there's one and only one other node that I can go to. So, so in this, ascendancy is maximal. Okay. In between is the real world. Okay. In between we have a, a, a network where there are, are some, some connections, but not all the connections. And uh, uh, the, the, the measure A comes from information theory. Actually, it's called, it's called mutual information. 
And I could put the formula on the board. I don't know. It probably wouldn't be too interesting to everybody. But, but the idea is that where are you between zero and the maximum? Um, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can take the network. I, I work with what are called weighted digraphs. Digraphs meaning directed graphs. Okay, the, 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 the links all have arrows. They're directed and they have weights. Okay, there's so, I, usually the weight is how much carbon goes from um, many, a small fish to striped bass, a big fish, so that there are numbers on them. Okay? Um, and uh, uh, I, can, I can tell, I can take this information and tell you where you are between these two so that, so that if, say, we're right here, uh, and there's a perturbation and it falls back to here, well, there's been, there's been a, a, a problem. Now, the question, when I first started all of this, I always thought that ecosystems would increase in ascendancy uh, and would maximize their ascendancy. That, that seems like a logical way to go. That's not what the data told me. Okay? The data told me something extremely surprising. Um, if, if this is zero, and, and suppose I normalize my ascendancy by, by some normalizing factor, it happens to be the, the diversity of the flows, the, the Shannon Wiener index of, of the various flows, you can normalize it between zero and one. And I, if I look at uh, the ascendancy of you know, some uh, 20 or so networks that I have, what I discover is that they're, they're, all, they're all grouped uh, right around 0 0.4. Uh, and this represents, this represents a balance. Uh, uh, systems with insufficient ascendancy uh, will, tend to, will tend to increase. I, I often I plot it. If, if, this is, if this is A is equal to the ascendancy over, uh, over that normalizing factor from 0 to 1, uh, and, and then I plot up here E equals minus A logarithm of A, what I discover is that, is that everything tends to, to plot out just a little bit to the right of the maximum of this particular function, which some of you will recognize as the Boltzmann function or, or, the, or Claude Shannon's uh, uh, definition of, of information. Uh, they plot out right here. What, what that's telling me is that there, if things, if a situation is down here, system is down here, uh, there are many possibilities for new autocatalytic loops to occur. And as those, those loops occur, the system climbs the hill. If they're over here, they become vulnerable to a perturbation which will come and reset them back here somewhere. Okay? So that the uh, um, systems that are overdeveloped uh, tend to collapse of their own. And I can even show you by, by, by means of a little numerical example how if, uh, if you start here, things tend to, to climb up here. But if you get over here and, and suddenly collapse, it, it, it comes way down, way down here, which is what you happen when you have an economic collapse and so forth. Um, so the bottom line is that while I thought originally that ecosystems would progress towards higher and higher ascendancy, Apparently, it's not the case. Various ecosystems from, very, from different habitats, different, different states of maturity, they all tend to, to, to cluster very closely uh, to, to this maximum, which hasn't been fully explained. It's a phenomenological result. Okay? And this is where you know, phenomenology provides um, uh, feed for theory. Okay? And now it's your turn as a biologist to come and explain why everything clusters. Around A equals point four. Well, we need to move to the next talk, but I'll just say one sentence to discuss over dinner. Uh, ascendancy one would be not flexible enough to survive in a world of disturbances. The, the word of disturbance? Uh, in a world where there are not many disturbances, ascendancy, maximum ascendancy would not be flexible enough. Not at all. It can't be so you know, all how I explain it. Yeah. But we discussed this over dinner. Yeah. And need to change to John uh, John's talk. Uh, should I say that we're going to move on a little bit?